morning. <laughs> Couldn't find my unmute button. <laughs> Good morning. We are on Facebook and we are recording, so we will begin. We will begin with Isaiah chapter 61, which is in the middle of what some people call third Isaiah. I would like to read the last verse in chapter 60, however, first, because it reminds me of something Peter said some time ago. You may recall we were discussing the timing of the second coming, and Peter noted that the first coming of Jesus occurred at the fullness of time, and he suggested that the second coming of Jesus will call, come at the fullness of time as well. And when I thought of this last um, verse in chapter 60, I thought of Peter. It says, the least of them shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will accomplish it quickly. In its time, I will accomplish it quickly. I think that's what Peter was saying a few weeks ago, and I very much appreciate it. Okay, here we go to chapter 61. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful chapters in the whole of worldly literature. <clears throat> It's also sort of a composite. I think there may be four different poems here. Some say five. Also, I think that verse seven is misplaced, that it should follow verse five, and I will read it that way. Now, I don't think the text should be changed. These are the way, this is the way the text arrived to us. We should keep it just the way it arrived. However, I think we can read it in a way that makes most sense to us. What happens is that the uh, person changes from first person, second person, third person, and uh, I think it's better to put those all together. However, there may be some Hebrew uh, form of poetry that makes it seem less cumbersome than it does to me. Okay, the, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. I'm pausing here because when Jesus quoted this, he quoted to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He did not quote and the day of vengeance of our God. Interesting. To provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities the devastations of many generations. So I'm now going to jump down to verse 7. Because their shame was double and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. Different poem, I think. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines but you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations and in their riches, you shall glory. Now, another poem, I think. I'm sure why I'm having all that commotion. For I, the Lord, love justice, and I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. Hey, another poem. 
I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. <clears throat> as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and, and as a garden causes what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. So let us pray. Dear God, we are mindful that it's the Abrahamic religions that give us hope. All the other religions other than Judaism and Christianity and Islam and then Sikhism, combination of Hinduism and Islam, all the nations and religions other than those see us stuck in an endless cycle of hopelessness. Things always will be as they have been. We read that in the Bible in the most pessimistic of all the books in the Bible, but generally speaking, we read there about the possibility of a new day, a new age, a new order, a new way of doing things. And for this flattening out of history with a beginning and a middle and a future, we give our thanks in Christ's name, amen. I would like to close maybe at 1230 today. We will be happy to leave the Zoom on without the recording, so those who want to continue the conversation can. But a number of us would like to go to the conference that will be at two o'clock our time yeah. and at Thanks. five o'clock in the east. So um, I'd like to stop a little bit earlier so that we can have a time to eat and take a rest and then get back to that conference. If you haven't seen the conference, it looks like it's going to be very good. It's on Christian nationalism, Adventism and prophecy. And it's been organized by Michael Campbell down at Southwestern Adventist University who recommended to us some time ago on Facebook that we read a book called Jesus and John Wayne. Now, it's a serious book, even though it has a rather flippant title, and it shocked me because it chronicles the existence of a whole counterculture beneath the horizon of normal culture here in the United States. It's a vast, you know, El um, Hillary Clinton once talked about this vast right-wing conspiracy. This is a vast right-wing Christian conspiracy, educating their children from their earliest years to be prepared to fight, to take up arms on behalf of Christianity in this nation. It is really, really sobering. I recommend the book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne. If you can get past that title, you'll find it to be a serious book. Okay, the conference is addressing that sort of issue. And that is a very, very important thing for us to be aware of and alert to. Um, I have put on Facebook, on my own channel and on the channel of Branson Legacy Sabbath School sessions and on the channel for Branson Legacy Sabbath School links, the poster and the link that one can click in order to register for this conference. Uh, registration is free but one must register in advance. So I hope that a number of us can join that conference. They expect about 3,000 people from around the country to tune in, and I think it's going to be worth your time and worth my time. Not only will Adventists be speaking, but some non-Adventists who are specialists in the history of religion in North America will be addressing the group as well. So with that, we move to Dr. Taylor and the fourth of these five discussions of Isaiah. Thank you, Bernard. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
Thank you again for this opportunity. And uh, we move to Isaiah 40 through 55. I've just been through a little panic here. I, um, <laughs> I had a um, PowerPoint and, and it wasn't where I thought I left it, but fortunately, uh, PowerPoint itself knew where it had been, so I am in contact with that. <clears throat> so that brings us to Isaiah 40. And uh, if you have your Bibles with you, um, well, we're all at home, so uh, <laughs> that shouldn't be um, a problem. And turn to Isaiah 40 and verse 1. I believe I mentioned to you that um, in my first year of Hebrew at Sydney University, uh, I had enrolled for the London Bachelor of Divinity uh, by correspondence. And uh, I contacted the individual who would proctor the exams, uh, which I was never to take. I had the opportunity to come here to the United States and took that. But um, he uh, mentioned that one either had to do an Old Testament introduction course or a, a Hebrew course, and I signed up for the Hebrew. And uh, so in first, in, um, yes, in first year, um, no, second year. In second year, we read four minor prophets, and then we had a little bit of time left over. And so the professor suggested that we try some Isaiah. Isaiah is to Hebrew like Mozart is to music and uh, or Paul is to the New Testament. And uh, instead of reading some of Romans, um, because it was, wasn't a Greek class, it was a Hebrew class, we read Isaiah chapter 40. Nakamu, nakamu, ami, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, it begins. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says your God, says the New Revised. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid. And it would be nice if it ended there, but it goes on that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And... Um, much ink has been shed over that double. Um, given the context, it, it, it's not the downer at the end of an uplifting expression. It's, it's all taken care of. Comfort, comfort. These are words from the Old Testament and words that we don't easily hear if we are part of the tradition that somehow God is the monster in the Old Testament. And uh, that was such a, a sad thing that was done to uh, many of us. But on the other hand, uh, it has been helpful to me personally to have had the opportunity to dedicate my life to my academic life to understanding the Old Testament and, and particularly the, the God of the Old Testament. And at this part in the text, we are precisely where the period is up. They were sentenced to 70 years, at least for the last two went into captivity. It was about 55 years before they had the opportunity to come back. Now, Picture that if you can, 55 years. It's now over 40 years that we've been in the United States and don't misunderstand me. I'm not equating that with a captivity. We came willingly and we stayed willingly. And, um, but you know, there's 40 of um, 40 plus of, of 55. Now, in our case, it's gone pretty fast. And of course, when they were in Babylon, they were not in prison cells or anything like that. Um, they had a certain amount of freedom. Remember the poem down by the rivers of Babylon and they were saying, sing, sing the songs of Jerusalem. And the psalmist says, how could we do that? How could we sing 
about uh, Jerusalem when we are in Babylon and we have such uh, fond memories of, of being in our home. However, when the time was up, as Isaiah had uh, of Jerusalem had predicted, only a remnant would return. And you may not be aware that at the time of Jesus, the main center for Judaism was Babylon, not Jerusalem. And uh, the best biblical texts that we have extant are from Babylon, from Iraq, if you will, not from Jerusalem. The Jerusalem texts uh, were quite midrashic. There were stories and things added to the text. And um, one of the passages in Numbers was used as a, as a surprise for me because of my comprehensives, I assumed that Midrash would be in Hebrew. I got it in Aramaic. Um, I took care of it, but it did take me by surprise. And um, so here we are with these Jews. The time has come for them to return, and many opt not to. And we actually have indirect, direct evidence um, both are true, indirect evidence, because that was not the purpose of it, but direct evidence, because in the annals from Babylon from the time uh, of the uh, Persian period, there are these Jewish Semitic names that begin to appear in business. And uh, we assume, I think, on, on safe grounds that these are those who were taken there and now have prospered and, and indicates the reason that they chose not to return. Isaiah 40 is at that point where they're about to uh, return to Babylon. As I mentioned last week, nowhere in 40 through 55, which is related to this period, does the text ever stop or in between 55 and 56, is there a passage comparable to 36 to 39 that we looked at last week, which is taken from Second Kings in our Bible and is uh, of Hezekiah's illness. And we noted uh, chapter 38, um, 38, 39, somewhere there. Um, and all of those chapters are taken from there. And 38, I believe it was, that was Hezekiah's um, sickness. Uh, no, his, yeah, and his uh, impending death and his prayer and so on. There's nothing like that. The text never stops. The closest we come to it then is right here at the beginning. And the verbs here are plural. This is the heavenly council. Comfort, oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid. Uh, verse 3, a, vo a, cry a voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. So here is the announcement. That's, this is the message that is cried out. Now, the Hebrew of the Old Testament does not have added, did not have vowels added. You simply had consonants and you read in the context the consonants. And uh, in class at Hebrew Union College, we in Midrash had to be able to read aloud the un vocalized text, it's called pointing, the unpointed text, uh, with full pronunciation. We had to be able to, to do that, which meant that there was a measure of ambiguity, but as it turned out, a small measure of ambiguity. And modern Hebrew, though it can be, is not normally supplied with vowels either. Newspapers, um, Haaretz is a used to be the only newspaper. I don't even know whether it's still being published, but I suspect it probably is. It adds vowels for those uh, who need them to be able to, 
uh, read the news, which left an ambiguity. And the ambiguity is uh, evident in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which reads the way our New Testament reads. A voice crying in the wilderness, like John the Baptist did, prepare the way of the Lord. But the original message was in the Hebrew, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, or put in English order, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Now, wilderness is a bewildering word um, to us uh, because it is literally a wilderness and a wilderness is like out here uh, east of us, the desert, the high desert, that's a wilderness in this context, although they did, or did they? Because I was gonna say they also had a word for that, but the word came to mind was Greek. And a rainforest is a wilderness as well. So context determines whether there's water present and it rains a lot, or the water is absent and it's a desert. And the original picture is the uh, of Babylon. And if you remember the map of um, the Middle East, you have the what uh, the British historian Breasted called the Fertile Crescent. You go up from up from um, Jerusalem, up through Lebanon, and around the top, and back down into um, Mesopotamia, follow the Euphrates down. That's the long way, and that's the way they would have been taken into captivity because um, trying to support a large group with water and food and so on for that distance and heat and all of that would not be possible. But they're coming back, as I mentioned last week, by the fastest route possible. So the crying is to prepare the way of the Lord in the in the desert, in through from Babylon east west to Jerusalem. Make straight the desert, the in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up by being filled in by bringing every mountain low. And I saw this actually in operation. Uh, when I was in college at Avondale in the early 60s, they were building the first freeway in Australia between Sydney and Newcastle, which runs close to Curranbaum, where Avondale College is. And they were blasting the tops of the mountains off where they wanted to put the road through and putting that rock into the valley. And so it's a, a, a very quite level road. It, it is basically a level road. It goes up and down and it, it goes around and about a little bit, but it was it was put straight through. And, um, and this verse came to mind in uh, connection with that. Now, we noted last week, especially in chapters 34 and 35, that chapter 34 had the tone and tenor of the Isaiah of Jerusalem, and that chapter 35 had the tone and tenor of Isaiah 40 through 55, and that here we had the, the passageway between Isaiah of Jerusalem and the later um, hundred years of uh, Isaiah 40 through uh, 55. Now, before too much time gets away on me, I want to share my screen and uh, share the PowerPoint with you. And that will follow with a particular focus on Isaiah 53. Now, I suggested you read the servant songs. Uh, I won't take the time to go through them this morning. Yesterday, taking my own advice, I sat, sat down again and read Isaiah's Isaiah 40 through 55 and, and luxuriated in this and um, remind you again, or, or if you haven't been present before, 
Isaiah 40, this portion of, of Isaiah in the Septuagint has often been referred to as the fifth gospel, um, along with, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when the Septuagint translation was being, being done, the translators had to sit down and to a large extent choose their vocabulary from either classical Greek or from Koine, the common Greek in which both Septuagint and New Testament are written, which is the language spread by Alexander and used in, in his army to be able to communicate with the troops because they were mercenaries and, and had all sorts of background. The common language was, was Koine. And when it came to translating the vocabulary of the gospels and the gospel, both not only uh, gospel in our Bible, but Paul and so on, the language was already in existence in Isaiah 40 and onwards in the Septuagint, and it was simply adopted in the New Testament. And with a little New Testament Greek, it's possible to go back and make your way quite a distance, especially if you have help with the irregular words to be able to read this passage. Uh, let me take my own advice and share my screen. Um, here we go. And share. Okay, now... So, the Hebrew prophets and uh, now it's working. You should have that full screen. Mine is the Hebrew prophets and we're in second Isaiah. I've chosen here English rather than the Deutero Isaiah to which it is usually referred. So, introduction. Traditionally, chapters 40 through 55 are attributed to Isaiah of Jerusalem, and we have studied that by now some 160 years past since his time. That is when we come to Isaiah 40, 160 years. Also, there are marked contrasts between the two sections. The circumstances are vastly different. The tone of the two is different. Most importantly, the latter lives through the return from exile. The second writer is steeped in the prophecies and traditions of the first. Thus, it's a kind of, he is a kind or she is a kind of distant disciple. Despite the differences, there are also close ties and, and this is important to understand. Words and phrases are repeated but there are also significant differences. Old concepts are placed in new service. There are three primary differences, a difference of mood. Earlier, the time of Isaiah of Jerusalem, there was concern for the nation's present sin. Judgment is spoken of as a future act of God. Later, judgment is a thing of the past. Immediate, the immediate future is the setting for a great act of God's salvation. And the oft-repeated phrase, fear not, al-tirah, al-tirah, do not fear, do not be afraid. It's a very encouraging passage, especially for these times. A difference of setting. The former clearly reflects the work of Isaiah of Jerusalem, who was active from 741 to 701, 40 years. The latter, equally clearly, the community of our Jewish exiles in Babylon. So, Isaiah of Jerusalem, 1 through 34, and then the bridging material, and then 40 through 55, 
the community of Jewish exiles in Babylon. At the same time, it's not by remote control. Three, a di and when I say by remote control, it's not Isaiah of Jerusalem sitting in Jerusalem in a different place and time and talking about something totally unrelated to who and where he is and what his interests and concerns are. It's a difference in time. The names of Isaiah's contemporaries appear in 1 through 39. The kings, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib of Assyria. In 40 through 55, the only proper name is the Persian king Cyrus. It's described, he is described in his historical role as the one who releases the Jews from their exile. So the historical context. Nebuchadnezzar, also known as Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I don't know whether you've noticed that in your Bible or whether your Bible contains those two names. We are accustomed to Nebuchadnezzar and we'll continue with that. He died in 562. Almost immediately, his vast empire began to decline. It was followed by several kings, none of which showed his skills. Nabonidus was the final Babylonian monarch, and he ascended the throne in 555 BC. Soon after, uh, he deserted the imperial city and lived in the Arabian desert. His son, Belshazzar, uh, in, uh, in Akkadian, you don't, there is no, there are no uh, vowels or consonants. They are syllables. You write syllabically. And so I've written it out syllabically, the English equivalent. And we know him as Belshazzar, was left in charge of Babylon. According to Babylonian records, many expected the collapse of the kingdom. However, they recorded, uh, it's recorded as actually well, or they re are recorded as actually welcoming it. They hoped something better would come. In October of 539, Babylon fell. It was conquered by the army of Cyrus, king of Persia, and fell without a fight. Cyrus had uncommon ability. He was son of a Persian king and a Median princess. And they, the two nations were merged and the Medio-Persian uh, is the way we often refer to it, especially in Adventist history. And they, uh, he, Cyrus embarked on a decade of conquest from Pakistan to the Aegean Sea. Um, this is a precursor in, in many ways of Alexander the Great. And finally, it was he turned his attention to Babylon. Two armies marched into middle Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is means between the river, the two rivers. Well, between the rivers. Uh, Potamos, uh, Hippopotamos is a river horse, Mesopotamia, in the midst of the rivers, the, um, now, now I can't think of either, Euphrates and um, the Tigris and Euphrates. And within days, Babylon fell, again, you know, without a, a struggle. The first time since the Sumerians, it was ruled from outside. So it's been a long time. Cyrus' domestic policy was very different. These predecessors used enforced exile. He allowed a large measure of autonomy. It's interesting to go back to uh, dictators, and he was a, a dictator, but certainly deserves the title benign dictator. And he had an expansive view. He clearly was not threatened. And so he allowed a large measure of autonomy and included the exercise 
of their own religious customs on their native soil. And if you know the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll recognize um, that was the policy that was adopted to in, in terms of the returning captives. And he allowed many captives to return home and they took with them the idols of their deities, which Babylon, the Babylonians had seized. Now, that seems an odd way uh, to describe the return of the Jews because they had no idols to take. It was the, the um, vessels of their temple that they took with them. Thus, at his, at his hand, pre -promised rest, the, the promised restoration took place. Ezra 6, 2 to 5 records the edict, and many Jews did not, but many Jews did not want to leave and return and most of them had never seen Jerusalem, but others remembered the traditions of Jerusalem and they longed to resume the Jewish presence there. In expectation of these events, second Isaiah carried on his public ministry. So the prophet in the book, no biographical information is available, but this is nothing new. It's assumed he is a Jew of the exile, deeply committed to the prophetic traditions associated with Isaiah of Jerusalem. And this assumes, no, this doesn't assume, this is based on the evidence of the close ties between the two. This is not a book that causes one to say, why on earth was this look? Uh, why on earth was this hooked with Isaiah of Jerusalem? With all three, there are deep ties, and this is uh, Isaiah and the following two books are like uh, Deuteronomy and the following historical books. We often refer to them as the Deuteronomic history. The history is interpreted in the light of Deuteronomy, which stands out apart from the rest of the Pentateuch. Interesting subject, but different time, though not necessarily a different place. So the prophet of the return is deeply committed to the prophetic traditions associated with Isaiah of Jerusalem. We of course are not even sure he was male, though if he male, I'm sure he was he, but doesn't cut both ways. Thus, we must focus on the words themselves. The result, a richness of imagery and style. And there are several different literary forms that were used. First is the trial speech. The Hebrew uh, word for this is reeve. Um, it's written R-I-B, but the second letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, that's the Bet of the Aleph Bet, is um, under, only under circumstances, certain circumstances is it pronounced B, otherwise it's pronounced V, or if you're in a seminary, W, wow. Uh, this is all familiar already from the oracles of Hosea. Hosea, and uh, it's a setting of a court of law, and <clears throat> the, there is no complete imagery that is used in the Old Testament. It gives the beginning, and it's a trial that God calls. The mountains are testifying, and Israel is called into question for why they're doing what they're doing and why they are not serving God. Uh, Micah 6 begins that way. And then in, in uh, verse 8, what does the Lord require but to do justice and so on. So if you read that through, you can hear God and um, the court setting. It's, it's well worth doing. And uh, there are some juridical parables in the New Testament, some uh, one in particular I used in a paper 
one ends with the court setting, the other doesn't. And um, it helped in my uh, the paper that I had to write about the Old Testament. Uh, if that's not clear, uh, feel free to um, ask a question about it. And Israel is on trial in Deutero Isaiah. Yahweh, through the prophet, acts as a judge and prosecuting attorney. Set forth your case, says Yahweh. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob, Isaiah 41. However, the verdict, the penalty has been paid. That doesn't occur in the pre-exilic prophets. Here, the penalty has been paid. This is a new and exciting day. The result, Yahweh's compassion, Isaiah 43, uh, 25. Let me just pause to read that. 43.25. I am he, Ani who. This is an expression that's the Hebrew of I am and is an antecedent, if not the antecedent, of John's gospel of ego a me. I am, the famous I am passages. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Accuse me, let us go to trial. Set forth your case so that you may be proved right. God is calling for, maybe daring, Israel to take God to court and try and prove him wrong. And he knows that he will uh, be successful in the case. And here the verdict is in. In other instances, the effect is achieved when a trial speech is followed by an oracle of salvation. If you're not familiar with that word, this oracle, at least in biblical studies, is used for a message direct from God. Now, in um, there were oracles from the Greek um, places where you went <laughs> and received oracles. Uh, that was uh, received. Uh, speech is followed by an oracle of salvation. The nation's deliverance is declared. 42.18 through 43.13. We won't read it now. But here is the oracle from God. Direct from heaven, the nation's deliverance is declared. B, the disputation. This is a philosophical argument where a question is raised, then answered in a forceful manner. And those of you who are familiar with Romans chapter 2, for instance, know that, and, and this was a Greek method of argument, the question is raised, and then the question is answered in a, in a forceful manner. And this is probably from the wisdom schools. It, it sought truth by the logic of the human mind. Um, in some ways, and I, I mean this only positively, that is where uh, theology fits into our understanding and, uh, as it were, defending God in uh, on the basis of human terms and, and how he has operated. In 2nd Isaiah, typic it typically addresses the question of Yahweh's nature and ability to do what the prophet claims Yahweh is about to do, save the people. Yahweh's nature and ability to do what the prophet claims Yahweh is about to do. This is addressed. Can God be trusted? Because they have gone into captivity. God appears to have abandoned them. And now he turns up and says, time's up. You've served your time. Good examples are found in chapter 40. Uh, as, for instance, verses 27 to 29. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. And so on. Uh, chapter 40 uh, is a chapter since I read it in the Hebrew so long ago that I luxuriate in and, and really uh, uh, appreciate. And you notice the mention of creator. We will come to that. But Isaiah 40 through 55, the return from captivity, they have learned their lesson and they recognize now because of where they are, the presence of the prophet, the presence of Ezekiel in Bab Babylon, which is heathen territory, that God, the God they left behind in Jerusalem, in fact, is present where they are now despite the fact that otherwise that would defile God, God makes, the God of the Israelite makes holy where they are and they are able to receive his blessing there. This is a great idea and this opens up to them in contrast to the inabilities of Marduk, who their God is and they take home the God of the world, the creator God, and link that with the God they left behind, who is the God of the Israelites, and they go back to a totally different experience. Now, the next category of uh, speech are the, is the oracle of salvation. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, perhaps, records words of the priest. An oracle of salvation records the words of the priest. Absolving a worshiper. The, God says to you, thus and so, and absolves the worshiper. Declaring an, indiv an individual just in the eyes of the law. Those were the oracles previously, or medically clean in the eyes of the community. Remember the laws in the Old Testament require people who were healed to go and present their evidence and sacrifice to the priest and the priest would declare them uh, if he ascertained that to be the case to be healed and therefore to be clean and therefore to be admitted back into the community. Here in Deutero Isaiah, the emphasis is on the saving activity of Yahweh, on the spirit of joy which this kindles in the heart of one saved. 41.10. Do not fear, al tira. there it is, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. The first person oracle, that's an oracle from God. The spirit of joy, which this kindles in the heart of one saved. The imperative fear not is a prominent feature. It's used with his favorite titles for Yahweh, Redeemer. Redeemer is to pay a price. And second Isaiah talks about God as Redeemer. But then a couple of chapters later said, I have redeemed you, but not with price. It's an analogy, a human analogy, but it's not to be pretended that it fits exactly. It's an analogy, it's a metaphor, it has its limitations. We have no divine metaphors, we are, com are confined to human language. The Holy One of Israel, which was also used by Isaiah of Jerusalem and serves to link the two passages. This is used frequently, the Holy One of Israel. They have come to recognize who God is and declared that 
what is about to happen is the result of Yahweh's own loving initiative. Nothing has forced God to do this. He has been with his people. He loves them and he is happy to bear the, the judgment, the verdict that the, they've paid for their everything has been met. They can now go home. They have learned the lesson, lesson of idolatry. The idols are nothing. They don't serve any use whatsoever. And D, the servant songs. We only have time to look at the last one, and we, we may have to borrow time to do that. The servant songs, these borrow the language of the royal court. They describe the individual and or group who was to do the work of Yahweh. They're generally regarded as the work of second Isaiah and close similarities of language. They have close similarities of language and thought. The identity of the servant is complicated. The role is not consistent in each of the four poems. At some points, the servant is passive, resigned to suffer suffering at other points militant and triumphant chapter 49 verse 2 at some points an individual at others the nation of israel ultimately for the christian of course it's jesus christ overall there are two different types of poetry in the book shorter articles each a distinct distinctive literary form likely delivered orally only later written down, and most are in chapters 40 through 45. Then there are longer poems, typically contain more than one literary form and appear composed as written documents, many in chapters 45 to 55. The themes in these chapters draw extensively from the past. Israel has a special relationship to Yahweh Yahweh cannot remain indifferent to humans, yet these themes appear in startlingly new form, in some cases superseded by new insights. They transform the traditional prophetic understandings, <laughs> period. <laughs> Yahweh is the Holy One of, Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel is the creator God who has no rivals. This is remarkable. It, it is remarkable how often the theme of creation surfaces. While not unique, the emphasis is not paralleled elsewhere. Babylonians believe that Marduk was creator, and they cele it's celebrated in the document that has survived the Enuma Elish that begins, um, that's the opening words. The pinnacle of that creation was Babylon. In contrast, the prophet attributes creation to the God of Israel. Further, Yahweh is the only God. There are no others. Thus, it's seen as the first explicit monotheist. B, theology, Yahweh is about to do a new thing, a new act of redemption by which to express love for the people. Creation and salvation are inextricably here tied to one another punishment is now over and god will act as redeemer it is a new exodus nowhere in these chapters is god's activity conditioned by any response on the part of the people finally cyrus the persian identified as the one who will carry out the will of yahweh he is described in terms usually reserved for the royal house of david my shepherd and shepherd always is a term for king. And in fact, in the New Testament, in uh, connection with the nativity, the uh, Greek says shepherd and the Latin Vulgate says pastor. Pastor is one of the Latin words for shepherd. And um, um, yeah, sorry, wrong passage. It says king. It, it uh, understands it as king. His, uh, Cyrus is called God's anointed, and that's the word that is later used of the Messiah, Mashiach. Uh, Mashiach is the verb to anoint. Mashiach is the Messiah. And Cyrus is called the anointed one, though he is not the Messiah. 
one foreign leader is used to judge the nation, another used to recreate it. See, the beneficiaries of the new salva salvation are not to be just the people of Judah alone, but all the nations. This is emphasized most strongly in the servant songs. There's little doubt that the universalism displayed here played an important role in helping shape the mission imperative of the Christian church. Two key texts, uh, comfort is plural in Isaiah 40, as I mentioned. These are members of the divine council and they speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Now it's imperative, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Warfare is the end of active duty, now returning. Double is more than enough. Forgiveness and salvation are inseparable. Um, verses three and four, the voice is not identified. In the Septuagint, the voice is in the wilderness as in the New Testament. Redemption is a conquering march like the victorious march in Babylon each year. A highway is to pre be prepared to speed their exit, the highway of Yahweh. The ultimate act of salvation, Yahweh's own nature will be revealed. The glory of Yahweh will be uncovered. 42, one to four, first of the servant song, sets the tone for those that follow. On the one hand, beauty and theological power. On the other, a veiled manner of description. Behold, 17 times used in Isaiah 40 through 15, 55, and only 13 times in the rest of the prophets. The human agent is royal rule. Once called, endowed with my spirit, equipped to do divine will. Mission, bring forth mishpat, justice. In Hebrew and Greek, justice and righteousness are the same word in each respective language. It, at core, it, it is who God is, justice. He will not fail. He will not burn dimly. He will not be bruised. It hints at the suffering described in the fourth song. Further, mispart is linked to Torah instruction. Again, this is, there is fulfillment in Christ. Now, um, let me stop this share and share the other one. And... Uh, well, let me, let me, whoops. Um, this should be it. My, no, it's not. Um, let me go out to here and Dear, oh dear, I'm, okay, now I, I'm okay. I have it now. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, oh no. <laughs> dear, oh dear. I'm not sure I can. Look, let's let's take a break, Dave. I think this is the best. And then when we come back, I'll have it set up rather than than <laughs> get more flustered here than I am at the moment. So back to you. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we are getting a good uh, thorough look at these passages, and I'm particularly interested in the connection between these passages and the idea of creation 
you touched on that. That's a very, very, what if we started our doctrine of creation in Isaiah rather than Genesis? Would it make a difference? I think it might. So here we are. At what time is it? It is in California. I can't quite see. It is 11.34, let's say 11.35. Let's be going, uh, try to get going again in 10 minutes. That would make it 11.45. Is that all right? 11.45. Thank you, David, everybody. David, make me a co-host, will you? I have. I made no. you a co-host a long time ago. I don't see it up here. Well, I'll do it again. It, right. It's up on mine. Well, I don't know. It says it doesn't say that for me. Huh. Oh. Okay, I'll do it again. Oh, yeah. And would you put up that site for the conference this afternoon? Yeah. Forrest? Yes. I can send you an email with all the info, too. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Huh. Okay, now I got it. I, don't, I did it before. I don't know why it didn't stuck. And it I did is, for Monty, it's, too. It's these little, yeah, Monty's up. I was starting to feel offended that you like Monty oh, better than me. Hmm? So. Well, you know, you got to face life. <laughs> Dave, Dave yes. I, um, my connection was bad and I got completely kicked out. So you did have me up and I, I lost when I got off the system. So I'm you sure did have me on. Monty. Pardon? Are you not able to hear me, Dave? Just uh, intermittently. Okay, yeah, I've got a terrible connection. Um, but anyway, I need to be rehooked up too. Okay, I, okay, let me try it.
Well, I think it's time to start again. Okay. Am I being heard? I'm here. I hear you, David. Okay. Um, now, people have been chiming in to see where they can register for the conference this afternoon at 2 o'clock. So let me give you several options. On Facebook, there are three places. One is my own channel, David R. Larson. Uh, if you go to David R. Larson with an O, you'll find the information you need. Or if you go to Branson Legacy Sabbath School links, you'll find it there. Or if you go to Branson Legacy Sabbath School sessions, you'll find it there. Now, there's another way to do this, though, and that is to go uh, on the Internet, go to NAD Adventist, NAD Adventist, NAD Adventist dot Zoom dot US. Now, another way would be to email Branson Legacy Sabbath School at Gmail dot com and we will email it right back to you. That may be the easiest. So Branson Legacy Sabbath School at gmail.com and we'll watch for that and send you the information as soon as we have it. Okay, I think that Bernard needs a little more time to continue his presentation. Am I right, Forrest? Yeah, 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 yes. right, yeah, right. Um, okay, Dave, um, I hope everybody can see the screen. Um, I have up there, it says Hebrew Bible Aramaic Targum. You will not be familiar, uh, not many, if any of you, will be familiar with the Aramaic Targum. So, uh, Hebrew Bible, of course, is uh, where our Old Testament is translated from, and that's on the left. On the right is the Aramaic Targum. Uh, let me see if I can use as few words as possible, but still communicate. Mm -hmm. At the traditional time of the book of Daniel in the 6th century, the Aramaic language, and Aramaic is a Semitic language, along with Phoenician and Akkadian and Syriac, and as I mentioned earlier this morning, Akkadian is syllabic. You have a, you had a soft clay of tablet, a soft clay tablet in your hand, left hand, and you had a triangular shaped wedge 
that you pressed into the soft clay and you made a series of triangles together and the combinations of triangles formed syllables. And we know of around 300 combinations that were used. It took a long time to learn, hard to write, hard to read. I studied Akkadian for a year. Then Aramaic came along with 22 little characters that formed an alphabet. Alphabet is based on Greek, alpha and beta. The, uh, at Hebrew Union College, we spoke of the alphabet. It was the Hebrew alphabet first, but all of them have 22 characters, Aramaic, Syriac, they're written differently. And in fact, what we call Hebrew today in Israel is actually a borrowed form from Aramaic. The Aramaic letters are often referred to as the square script, and most of them fit within a square. Uh, when I, uh, in the early days of computing, uh, at, uh, I was one of the first to describe in a nine by 11 matrix for an Epson FX printer, the Hebrew characters and all by one letter would fit in that box. Um, I had to have special methods for the equivalent of our English letter L. Uh, it needed uh, an extra run of the, the uh, printer to do that. So those are the Aramaic characters. The old Hebrew is a much more difficult script to read. That's Aramaic. And it was adopted in the Semitic world, fifth, uh, sixth, fifth centuries, and it spread like wildfire because it was so easy. A simple syntax and a, a, only 22 characters to learn. And I've, I've taught that in a one class session to my students and they've been able to pick it up. Uh, that's Aramaic. And so with the, the spread of it, it became in the Eastern world, the standard language. And a form of Aramaic was spoken by Jesus when in the New Testament, his direct quotations are not in Greek, they're in Aramaic. Now, some have questioned this, but uh, I don't believe that to be the case. And Syriac is a Christian Aramaic dialect. And the New Testament was first translated not into Latin, but into Syriac and Aramaic dialect, which meant that over time, and now we're back to what's in front of you, the Aramaic Targum. What is in front of you is a translation. I don't remember whether this was mine um, or from a published source. Uh, we did translate it in class. And this is Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. And they are known as the Targumim is the plural or Targumim with an N. Hebrew, you have an M. Aramaic, you have an N. They're two different languages like uh, Spanish and Portuguese, two separate languages, but very close together, or like uh, Spanish and Italian. Um, some of you may have experienced what our daughter Danelle experienced when with the La Sierra Spring in Paris program, they went to Italy and they found that um, <laughs> the girls, the women, for instance, could speak to the Italian guys in Spanish and the Italian guys could speak to them in Italian and neither of them knew what the other had said, but they both understood each other. <laughs> and for those who there were there, that's what I understand the experience was like. So at a later time, 
Aramaic equivalents were provided for the verses that we know in English from the Hebrew Bible. Okay, now let's look at it. First of all, I'll read the Hebrew Bible. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which he has, for that which has not been told them they shall see and that which they have not heard they shall understand. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And white space, of course, equals dif differences between the two texts. 53.2, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. Or we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before the, its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave, uh, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied." By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, I didn't mention it, but that translation is from the New Revised Standard Version. And you are familiar with it and its application in the New Testament to Jesus. Uh, I will just uh, remind you that in the Old Testament, this was a passage that referred to the nation of Israel in places like here and in other places to an unnamed individual. This was the mission of the returned captive, uh, captives in the light of the experience that begins in Isaiah 40 and their, the fact that they are redeemed, forgiven, the Holy One has blessed them and, and, and all of that. I talked about that in connection with the, the slideshow. I won't spend any more time with that. However, let me rewind as it were to the top and um, 
Carol asked the question the first week. I, I don't know whether the, Carol, whether you're on this morning or not, but here is the answer that I promised you. And for all of you, come with me now to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, in the Gospels, there is an expectation of a military Messiah that will lead the Jews of the day to victory over the Romans. And the question was asked, if this, if the Hebrew Bible is referring, first of all, to the nation of Israel, where does the notion come from in the New Testament that there would be a military Messiah. What I'm about to share with you is not necessarily the ultimate source of that, but at least in this, the translation of the Aramaic interpretation and Targum means interpretation, this came from the synagogues that grew up between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. In the Old Testament, we have the Israelite religion. Then that stopped when we, we have no further access to that once, uh, once scripture stopped. But instead, we have Judaism arising, and in the synagogue, they would take the Hebrew scriptures and they would read them, and that would be the scripture for the day. They would read the Hebrew. Remember, Jesus stood up in Nazareth and read from the Hebrew of Isaiah, and then there was an interpretation, and he provided it. It. Behold, this scripture today is fulfilled in your sight and, and so on. And eventually those Targums were written down. You've heard the Hebrew. You have it alongside. Sorry, my world's going off here. Uh, okay. Um, so... These, the Aramaic Targum text, where it's bolded, are the differences between the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Okay, now we read. Behold my servant, the anointed one, Mashiach, that's the Messiah, shall prosper. He shall be exalted and increase and be very strong. As the house of Israel hoped for him many days, for their appearance was wretched among the nations, and their countenance beyond that of the sons of men. You will see here the application of the words in the Hebrew Bible that are singular now to the nation of Israel and it will all be applied in this manner. Verse 15, so shall he scatter many nations, the anointed one, kings shall be silent because of him, and they shall set their hands upon their mouths for the thing which they had not heard have they perceived. Now they're perceiving it. Who has believed these our tidings and to whom has the power of the mighty arm of the Lord been so revealed? And the righteous, let me bring this up. And the righteous shall grow up before him, even as budding shoots, and as a tree that sends forth its roots by streams of water, so shall the holy generations increase in the land that was in need of him. His appearance shall not be that of a common man, 
but his countenance shall be a holy countenance so that all who see him shall regard him earnestly. This is a major rewrite, as you can see. Then shall the glory of all the kingdoms be despised and come to an end. They shall be infirm and sick, even as a man of sorrows and as one destined for sicknesses, and as when the presence of the Shekinah was withdrawn from us, they shall be despised and of no account. I'm getting too excited about this. Verse 4, then he will pray on behalf of our transgressions and our iniquity shall be pardoned for his sake. <clears throat> Though we were accounted smitten, stricken from before the Lord and afflicted. But he shall build the sanctuary that was polluted because of our transgressions and given up because of our iniquities and by his teaching, his Torah, shall his peace be multiplied upon us and by our devotion to his words, our transgressions will be forgiven. And here you see written into this passage, uh, understandings prominent in the New Testament by our devotion to his words, by his teaching, or we like sheep had been scattered. We had wandered off each on his own way, but it was the Lord's good pleasure to forgive the transgressions of us all for his own sake. He was praying and he was answered. And before he opened his mouth, he was accepted. The mighty ones of the people shall he deliver up like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a ewe that before her shearers is dumb, and there shall be none before him opening his mouth or speaking a word. Out of chastisements and out of punishments shall he bring our exiles near. And the wondrous things that shall be wrought for us in his days, who shall be able to recount? For he shall take away the dominion of the peoples from the land of Israel, and the sins which my people sinned shall he transfer unto them. And he shall deliver the wicked unto Gehenna, and those that are rich in possessions which they have obtained by violence unto the death of destruction, that those who commit sin may not be established nor speak deceits with their mouth. And it was the Lord's good pleasure to refine and to purify the remnant of his people in order to cleanse their soul from sin. They shall look upon the kingdom of their anointed one, again the Messiah. They shall multiply sons and daughters. They shall prolong days. And they that perform the law of the Lord shall prosper in his good pleasure. From the subjection of the people shall he deliver their soul. They shall look upon the punishment of them that hate them, and they shall be satisfied with the spoil of their kings. By his wisdom shall he justify the just in order to subject many to the law, and for their transgressions shall he make intercession. Then will I divide unto him the spoil of many peoples, and the riches of strong cities, he shall divide the booty, because he delivered his soul unto death and subjected the rebellious to the law. And he shall make intercession for many transgressions, and the rebellious shall be forgiven for his sake. Now, that's a lot to take in, I understand. But I do want you to i did want you to have the opportunity to hear that on the one hand the hebrew passage first to the nation of israel when that didn't work out anywhere near its fulfillment in between isaiah 55 
and 56, a generation later, apocalyptic arose, created a world into which Jesus stepped. But the very passage that seemed to address who Jesus was is more deeply interpreted by Judaism in relationship to the Jews and their future at, the, uh, at and after the time of Jesus and interpreted that the Messiah would be victorious, not suffer, Israel would suffer, and the Roman Empire would be overthrown. Who could anticipate that such could arise from such a passage that is so dear to our heart in Isaiah chapter 53. So this is a way mark. How far along, we don't know. But you can see how with the Aramaic Targum, you can bridge from where they were to what it became during and after the time of Jesus. Here we see the Messiah becoming a military Messiah, going forth to conquer, and the interpretation is so different uh, between the two. Please understand me, I am not making anybody wrong here. It's how it turned out, and we have been blessed by much of this but some moved in other directions and Jesus found it necessary to step outside of that in Acts chapter one, when the disciples asked if he would set up his kingdom now, anticipating that what had been predicted would be about to happen because Jesus had been called the Christ, the Messiah. Christ is the Greek equivalent of Messiah, which is the anointed one. That's a lot, but that also needed to be added in here as part of Isaiah 40 through 55. Not only is that a later generation, the interpretation of the fourth of the servant songs takes us down to the time of Jesus and after and the understanding of the Messiah and his role. Dave, I hope that's enough for you for one morning. I'll turn it back to you. Well, I think it's more than enough. I, uh, I'm not sure I can handle it all. Let me make, let me see if I understand what's going on here, okay? And I'll tell you what I understand and then please correct me where I'm wrong. It seems to me I've just heard that in Isaiah, the messianic expectation is not militaristic. And can you hear me? The gospels, it is militaristic. Because I can't hear you. Oh. Is anyone else having a trouble hearing Dave, or is that my problem? I think it's your problem, uh, Bernard, because I can hear him fine, and I'm downstairs, and he's upstairs. <laughs> well, okay. What can we do? Oh, uh, let me see. One second, one second. Well, I don't think you can fix it, Dave, because you're you're coming through fine. It's uh, Bernard's uh, probably needing to adjust his audio, his uh, audio. Well, okay, let's continue the discussion without him till he joins us. How's that? <laughs> Uh, let, so let me ask uh, the rest of you, and Jerry uh, particularly, I thought I heard Bernard saying that what was expected in the Messiah in Isaiah was not militaristic, but that in the Gospels and Acts, what was expected in the Messiah was militaristic, and that the Targum, Aramaic Targum, is uh, to be considered seriously as we ponder this transition. 
Is that's, that anywhere near what he said? Uh, that's also, I think, what I heard, except that, well, first of all, let me just say, uh, this is new to me. I had not known this about the, 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 the way it's interpreted in the, in the Targum. Um, Bernard, are you hearing us? I am now. Thank oh, okay. you. Yeah, or it was also. my problem. So Dave, Dave, maybe you better try this out on Bernard because it's certainly not my area of expertise. This is rather new to me. Well, uh, I was trying out my understanding, and that is, if I understand you correctly, Bernard, you were saying that the expectations of a Messiah in Isaiah were not militaristic, but that the expectations of a Messiah in the Gospels and the first part of Acts were militaristic. And how we get from Isaiah to the Gospels is to be understood very seriously by way of the Aramaic Targum. That's where uh, the bridge is between the two. Um, and yeah, that's what I understand you to have said. Did I get it right? There's only one word I would change. It's not, I can't guarantee that this is the link, but it is a link. Everything else is correct. Uh, and it could be the link. This could be where it came from, but we don't have enough surrounding information to make such a statement. But first of all, to put it in the passive, it did happen. It did happen between the Old Testament and the Targums in the New Testament, the switch of language. I don't think it's la it's language based. It was the language of the time. During that time, here we can see that it happened, that the interpretation changed as Judaism took to their heart the fourth servant song. The pre the um, the rabbi in the synagogue in his interpretation over time took it to be Judaism, Israel, that was the one being punished and it was and and God was made more glorious by their experience and this opened the way for a military interpretation that was brought to it that God would deliver Israel, which became specific between Israel and Rome at the time of Jesus. Would it be uh, pushing it too hard to say that Jesus, as he's portrayed in the Gospels, Jesus reverted back to Isaiah's understanding of the Messiah rather than to the Targums? understanding. Now, you said he stepped out of the Targums, Targums uh, way of looking at things, but could he have stepped out and back uh, to Isaiah? What do you think? Good question, and I, I, I appreciate it, and I, I've had a lot to say, and, it, you know, trying to keep uh, track of everything. First off, the the Targums, <clears throat> there are those who believe that the Targums were, were written much later, you know, third, fourth century. Uh, my professor, who at the time was um, arguably the top Aramaicist uh, in the world, as it turned out, and he inclined to an earlier date for the Targums. Whether they were written by this time we don't know, but we do know that it was the Hebrew that was, was read, but Jesus accepted and brought to it a, um, well, no, let me put it this way. Jesus read the, the Hebrew um, and he read the Hebrew of Isaiah and he is, he adopted the language, but not. But he he clearly didn't adopt the 
the um, military picture of the Messiah. That didn't arise, of course, until after his resurrection and the disciples finally linked into it and, uh, and then asked in Acts if he would set up his kingdom. And at that time, he stepped away from it. I hope that an um, answers your question. And, and if not, somebody will um, pick up on it. Uh, and and uh, Jerry, I appreciate um, your comments. And this is what I anticipate. I never heard this. I, I heard that it happened, but nobody ever offered any account of how that came to happen. We didn't read it that way. How did they read it? And I was surprised to when we, well, by the time I had my Aramaic class, I knew that this interpretation was there, but I asked that we actually translate it in class. And there's interesting things that are done. Hebrew words are read as Aramaic words and, and things along that line uh, that, that eventually led down this path. Okay, thank you, Bernard. Over to Forrest. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Uh, it's very enlightening to, to hear about the Targums, but I'd like to step back just further. Is this passage even in Isaiah 52? Uh, and 53, even re re referring to the anointed one, the Messiah, a future Messiah, or is that an addition as well? It's not. You're correct. That's a very helpful question. The, there is no mention of the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible, even if you get Young's or Strong's concordance and look up the King James Version and find the word Messiah, that's in Daniel 9, I think verse 24, but in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, there it's the anointed one. It's not yet an office. So you are quite correct. It's not about the Messiah. The concept we'll talk about next week. We're in Isaiah 53 this week, but next week, the concept of apocalyptic and Messiah will come to the fore. So um, if you uh, wait till then, then you will have a clearer picture of uh, what developed here. Um, okay. And maybe that won't be very hard to do. Uh, I know this is a lot of material that has come at you, but I want you to sense it in its context. Let me just ask a, a follow-up question. How were these passages used originally? Were they in the congregation, uh, in Hebrew schools? Uh, just how did they use those with the, with the Jews? Um, I love to tell these stories. You asked the question, so, so here comes. So, <laughs> Sabbath morning on Shabbat, went to the synagogue, and the synagogue consisted of singing and prayer and preaching. Now we take that for granted, but it's only because we adopted through Paul, the Jewish service content. You go to other Asian, you go to Asian religions, for instance, that's not the case. Some religions have no preaching, some have no singing. And uh, in 1 in, in, um, Corinthians, Paul goes back to the model of Jewish worship. That's what we did. This must be God's way. So they went to the synagogue and the services were very much like the worship services in the Lutheran church at the time of Bach. The reason why there are so many, uh, much of Bach's music is, is set to hymn music is that during the worship service, which went typically often for three hours, there was a, a recital there that, you know, broke the, the, broke it up into something that was now for the congregation. And uh, there, the Bach would play 
variations on the hymn of the day and he would extemporize. So in the synagogue, so there would be the reading of a passage from the third part of the Hebrew Bible, the law, the prophets, and the writings. From the writings, and especially in connection with Samuel's chariot. It's an odd thing, but these were children's stories for adults. And so it would begin. And this was a way to bring the old religion into the present. And they would tell stories and it was the equivalent of, and so you see boys and girls that we used to hear so often in children's stories, when the rabbi came back to the verse he started with, was called the Patikta. This was the little portion that he took from somewhere in the writings and weaved a web, as it were, of intrigue in the modern setting. And Edom, Moab, Edom was a common theme because Edom was used to describe Rome and to protect themselves, they hid the identity of who they were talking about by using Edom, which was a related people to them. And that way they could hide it. So that went on and then eventually it would stop. And then there was the sermon of the day and somebody would stand up and read. You stood to read, you sat, to teach. Remember Matthew's gospel? Jesus went up into the mountain and sat down. This was a teachable moment. People knew when he sat down that they were going to get a sermon, a teaching, however you want to describe it. And they stood up when scripture was read. And Jesus went to synagogue, went to uh, Nazareth and the synagogue. He stood up. He was the reader of the day. He was up front. And uh, he was the, um, uh, the word's not coming to me. So he read. Then he interpreted. He said to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Other things I'm sure were said, but that was the interpretation, the Targum in Aramaic. You read the Hebrew text, read from the scroll. Later in the uh, Talmud, there are rules about how to do this. And the reader, the lector, was not to look down because some of these got so wild, they didn't want the hearers to think that this was what the Hebrew said, what the sacred scriptures said. This worship service was where they learned how to live, what to do, how to be, and illustration. There were, some of it was truth, some of it was fables to illustrate the point they wanted to make. And those targums became standardized, especially from Babylon. In Babylon, they stayed true to the text. In Palestine, they added a, a lot of agada or agadas, the, the stories that were added into there about certain rabbis did certain things. So when I had to do Midrash, I got Palestinian Aramaic because that was much further away from the, the text, the Hebrew text, than it would have been if it was Babylonian. So there's a lot of, lot of aspects to this. I know it seems like every time a question is asked, I have to say a lot. It's because all of this is unknown 
but this is the way that it was conducted. Thank you very much. David, we're at the 1230 hour right now. Unmute yourself. Okay. Um, is there somebody standing in line? Anybody off? No, I don't. I don't have anybody. Uh, Forrest, do we have somebody in, in mind? Okay. Well, this is a very good time then to, to pause. It says my internet connection is unstable. Can't hear me? Yes. And that is correct. Uh, can I be heard? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you. Why don't we conclude for today uh, and continue this next time? This has been uh, illuminating from a historical point of view. Now we need to pause and ask ourselves, well, okay. Um, how does this help us in our daily walk? And I think it does. Uh, but in ways that may not, we may not uh, anticipate. That is, how much liberty should we take with the text? It seems to me that the people who did the Targum took a lot of liberty. Uh, they, they kind of, like you said, though, it's, it wasn't a translation. It was an interpretation. And that, that makes it uh, more understandable. But uh, how far dare we deviate from the text uh, is an interesting question for me. But we will pick it up here next week. Meanwhile, let's get to the conference this afternoon at 2 o'clock California time. If you have not received the link to register um, and have no other way to do it, email David R. No, 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 no. Email Branson Legacy Sabbath School at gmail.com, and we will send you the link by return mail. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much. Let me um, have the benediction, and we'll conclude. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Sabbath day, and uh, thanks, Dr. Taylor. <laughs>